Cash Flow Diary Podcast, Episode 202. Welcome to yet another exciting episode of the Cash Flow Diary Podcast. The podcast that teaches you insider tips, tactics, and strategies for creating leveraged streams of cash flow into your life. Learn from top performing entrepreneurs, business owners, investors, and thought leaders from across the globe as they share their secrets to success. Like what you learn on this and other Cash Flow Diary podcast episodes? Go to learninvestingnow.com and sign up to receive powerful tips and information that will help you succeed as an entrepreneur and investor. Now, here's your host, investor, entrepreneur, business owner, educator, speaker, author, and master facilitator of Robert Kiyosaki's cash flow game, Jay Massey. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Cashflow Diary Podcast. I am your host, Jay Massey, and I'm glad that you are here today because we are talking to more of those excellent individuals that are out there that have done things that you may not have considered. This primarily being one thing. Many of, I know when I was first getting started, I, the idea of being able to earn a six-figure income all year was like, wow, that would be great one day if I could only possibly ever hope to have such a thing happen to me. But he, here's a new concept that I want to make sure that everybody understands is totally possible, and it is possible in many different ways. Instead of six figures in a year, what if you did that in a month? What do you think goes into making that happen? So instead of guessing at it, I figured, hey, why not gather some people who've done it and then we can just ask them questions and then all we have to do is go out there and continue to duplicate. You've heard it from me enough, right? And you know that real estate's a place to do it. And yeah, we've talked to some real estate people, but now we're going to be talking to something a little different. And I think you'll be able to gain some lessons from that as well. Today's guest is none other than Daryl Lyons, and he's out there in the great state of Texas. Everything is big in Texas, as you know, and so there's only one way to do income out there, and that's big because it's Texas. It, it, it almost makes sense, right? So we're going to find out how he's done it, how he does it, and most importantly, we'll see if we can't squeeze some lessons from him that will help you do the same thing. So help me welcome Daryl Lyons. Daryl, how are you doing? I'm good. Thank you. Uh, I know that when we first got started, we had some uh, connection issues, but I got those all resolved, so I'm good to go now. Well, you know, technology is great when it works. So uh, I, I, I'm guessing, though, uh, this isn't the first time you've <laughs> had a challenge <laughs> in business. Is technology? I mean, you're not going to let something as small as a as a uh, Skype connection hold you down. No, no, I'll figure it out. I've got about. 30 computers around here, so one of them will work. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just keep plugging until something happens. Keep some uh, until something happens. Now, um, for for those listening, and y you being the you know first time guest on the show, it, could you give us a little bit of background, who you are, where you came from, but most importantly, you know, what was the industry that you were able to do this in, and and, and what is it that you're doing now? Yeah, I'd love to share that. Uh, story briefly. And I, I do want to encourage your listeners, if they haven't seen your story uh, on your website, they need to go see it. It was powerful. So um, if I do half as good a job as you did, then uh, I'm in good shape. But I, uh, I started out uh, really without money uh, and we grew up uh, struggling financially. So that could have been a, a part of the motivation to hustle and to earn a living is just so you don't digress back into a trailer park in a small town called Castroville, Texas. So, you know, I would say initially the motivation was just fear driven. But once you start to figure things out, you start to figure out there's some um, there's some ways to to improve your skill sets, and then there's also some things you learn along the way, uh, both by trial and error. And and so what I did is to understand money as I started out in the financial services industry. But I was not one to just uh, default into the industry. I was very focused, uh, even at the age of 18, to be in the financial services industry because I wanted to understand money. And so I did work my way through college at Bank of America, and that's how I paid my way through school. But I. I didn't see how you could possibly 
earn a, a decent living, uh, the, at least to the degree that I wanted to, without spending 35 years as a corporate executive and working <laughs> way up. And I just didn't have time for that. So uh, I bailed out of the banking industry. And the financial services, which as you know, because you were licensed, allows a, a really um, low barrier to entry, a, a, a very high barrier to success, but a low barrier to entry. And, and very much like real estate, you know, you think you get in, you're going to make a ton of money, but that just isn't the case. You've got to nearly go bankrupt, which is what I did n- nearly several times. And so in the financial services industry, I got licensed, got my insurance license in Texas and, and got my investment license and became a certified financial planner and got even more education and more learned more about, about the industry. And, and as I became a, 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 an advisor to one individual uh, or to individuals, uh, I started to build teams around me, and 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 so then we started. To, I, st- I started to transition from just an individual advisor, which is there's a lot of pride in that, to actually a business owner, and where we now serve two thousand families, and and I have eighteen employees. Wow, exactly. See, and there's so much in this that I, I can't wait to, to unpack some of that because I think many uh, of you listening, you'll hear some of the same patterns that you've heard from some other individuals who have been able uh, to hit those milestones and markers. Uh, but I, I'm I'm curious, why find? I mean, at age 18, financial services isn't that typically uh, that's typically the gray hair game, man. <laughs> yeah. It, <laughs> No doubt. I'll never forget. It was about seven or eight years ago. I was on a plane. Uh, I'm, st- I'm 38. I'm still a young guy. Uh, but I was on a, a, a plane and a guy, uh, it, was, it was in D.C. and I was lobbying in D.C. That's a whole nother story. But uh, a guy uh, sat down next to me and said, hey, man, if you look around, everyone on this plane has gray hair except you. So tell me your story. <laughs> 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 and so that's been that's that has been really the uh, a lot of my life is just being a young guy. But what's really cool is I've, I've made up for it in other ways. And and I know wisdom experience. There's no substitute for that. But, you know, with a high level of energy and humility and a, and a, and a, and a lack of uh, there's a feel, fear fear. But uh, there's mostly just a, I didn't care if I got rejected. I didn't have this pride or there's a lot of humility because I would knock on doors. I tell you what, I must have knocked on thousands of doors from trailer parks to executive offices. And, and I don't think senior people with, with silver hair who are driving nice cars were willing to do that kind of stuff. But I was able to put myself in a very low place and just get lucky. I mean, you know, I think in San Antonio where I'm from, there's over a million people. If you put a a note and and tape it to the 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 tail end of a dog and say um, I'm selling something. Will you buy it from me? And I think eventually somebody would buy. <laughs> and it's that was my attitude. Is I said, you know, if, if I'm not good yet, I knew I wasn't good. I said, if I'm not good good yet, I'm just going to be lucky. And so I would just go around and and play the odds and knock on enough doors. And eventually I got lucky. I got lucky a handful of times. And 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 then when I got lucky, I'd ask for those people, hey, do you know anybody else I, uh, that you can yeah. refer me to? And and that's how I built it. Well, and I, I think that that says a lot uh, about the, the work ethic. And, and there's a concept that we often talk about is failing fast, failing forward, and failing frequently. And in, and it sounds like you weren't afraid uh, to do that. So where, where would you think that comes from? You know, um, I think that I didn't have anything to lose, you, you know, <laughs> I mean, what was I going to go back to the trailer park? You know, it wasn't that bad really. <laughs> right, and so, right. so with nothing to lose, I was hustling and I know different, I know your audience is in a different place, uh, in terms of, you know, they do have things to lose, uh, and so there's a different context there. But if you, if I could be transparent and honest, it was just because I, I felt I didn't have anything to lose. The other thing was, um, I didn't see. I, I kind of look at a lot of decisions that I make in terms of risk reward profile, uh, mm-hmm. and that's just how I've been trained. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So uh, I felt the risk of, of 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 pressing on and making mistakes was worth the reward. And I felt the risk of being um, complacent and of uh, comfortable. Uh, I, th- I thought there was a high degree of risk there, and the reward wasn't that great. Does that make sense? Oh, it makes perfect sense to me. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many times people feel like, you know, hey, I'll just keep my money in cash, and that's clearly safer. And I'm like, uh, compared to what? <laughs> exactly. So the, the, let's 
let's unpack this a little a bit though. You you mentioned you started at eighteen. You're thirty eight now, so that's a twenty years difference. So, uh, so as far as the concept of being an overnight success, does it take twenty years? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> gosh, for me, maybe because I make a bunch of dumb mistakes, but uh, I certainly have seen people make it faster. And and you know what? I've passed up all those people. Uh, I, and I say that, that sounds arrogantly arrogant, but I've seen a lot of people who made it much faster than me that are no longer around or, or struggling. And, and, and I don't know, there's something to be said about that that crock pot approach to business where you just have this, you're just, you're just taking your time. And many people, they make that first hundred grand or whatever that money is. And then they quickly adjust their lifestyle to that. I would take that money. Anytime I made money, I would typically reinvest much of it almost to where my standard of living was really just odd. Even today, I'll tell you, uh, um, I can afford a lot of stuff, but I, I drive a car that's literally worth $5,000. <laughs> and, and, and so, yeah, I can afford it, but why? I don't like to buy things that go down. And so if it still runs, I'm good. And, and I think that's been my attitude for years is that I've always reinvested back and never made this – um, this had this complacency lifestyle and, and, and ultimately get to the point where I'm comfortable. Cause I always feel that that's always a conflict is, is my comfort versus growth was always, if I, if I was comfortable, that means I wasn't growing. So I've always had a little degree of discomfort there. You know, when you, you, you're from Texas, you're not allowed to mention crock pots and me suddenly not think about food. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that, 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 that's just not fair, man. You're just like crock pot and food. Now I'm like all distracted, start thinking about barbecue and, and, oh, and, yeah. and just all this other stuff. So I'm I'm trying to be focused here, but <laughs> I, I want to continue on this crock pot analogy because I, I think there's something there. I mean, uh, in today's day and age, I mean, if you look on TechCrunch, you look on uh, websites and blogs that you hear these stories of, you know, individuals who at a very, very young age end up doing something very, very significant. And it feels like, and it can feel like the, uh, the, the idea can be, well, I'm gonna start something. And in six months from now, this is where we're going to be. And I'm going to this and this, that and the other, but you're, you're putting forth a concept that that's kind of contrary to that. Well, I'm I'm of the generation when I graduated. When I was an undergrad, I was um, um, I was dot com guy. You know, I uh, ninety five to ninety nine, and and I was in undergrad. I was giving advice to MBA students on how to invest their money, and I I I've I was in the crux of all that. Many people around me um, were dot comers. Uh, I had one company that I graduated from St. Mary's University. There's another school right around the corner called Trinity. Um, the kids there, we came out. I started my financial services industry. I was talking to somebody, trying to pitch them to invest with me. Uh, these three guys said no. They were putting their money in this company called Rackspace, and this company uh, went public and, and has done well, which is cool. That's the, that's the story that you, you hear. But I got to tell you, for every Rackspace buddy that I tried to pitch – there's about 10 or 15 of my buddies that tried to do it and 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 are now working for somebody today. Right, right. Yeah. That well, you that that's getting lucky. <laughs> if you if you picked if you bet on rag space you got lucky cuz you didn't yeah, I mean it's kind of hard to duplicate. It, it is is basically what you're getting at. So uh, from the standpoint of being able to you know, create your own entity, manage jobs, and 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 make these transitions. So, get, when you look at the marketplace today, can anybody, in your opinion, be able to to do what you've done? Is that possible? Yeah, certainly. I think I think we we really got to get that crockpot mentality and just recognize this is a long road and 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 not use people as transactions but as relationships long term so not try to milk every single dollar out of that person but rather try to pr- bring value and 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 recognize them for who they are as a person and so that takes a long time and 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 so i think it is a degree of burning bridges you know, many people start businesses and they have an idea that if this doesn't work out i'm going to go do something else um i find many people who have been able to make good money, burn the bridge, and said, I'm going to do this, and even if I fail, I'm doing this. And when I hear very successful people, 
the ones that really do great things, many people just say, I'm all in. And, and that's the attitude I have. Yeah. Uh, I, I often tell people, a friend of mine uh, told me once that you, you just, if you made a mistake, you just paid full price for it. Uh, the, the best you should do, at least what you should do is turn around and offer your now wisdom to someone else at a discount. And that's, I, I think there's a lot of wisdom in, in doing that because you've just learned from the mistake. You'll never make that one again. and You'll make a different one. However, you, you're bringing up a completely different mindset. And, you know, at, at some point, if we continue with this crockpot analogy, you're going to have <laughs> to give us uh, the recipe for, for success and being able to not only change our mindset, but to, to go out there and, and, and take action. So, we, I think we have to align our thoughts and our actions in order to be successful. Would you agree with that? Yeah, that's great. Okay. So do you, so if that's the case, success begins with the mind. And how on earth did you manage to develop the mindset required to, to stick through all those challenging times? You know, most people, they experience a failure event and run the other direction. So uh, it might have been manufactured when I was real young. I remember that my father, when he was a young executive, probably close to my age, and in the 80s, it was the savings and loan crisis, and he went to um, go to work one morning, and he put his key in the door, and it didn't work. So he called the building management, and building management um, said that the, the request to change the locks came from corporate, and sure enough, he was fired. And he was doing well at that time. Our family was. We had a couple cars and a boat in a nice house in a small town in Texas. But at that time, we started to go downhill financially, and we had material financial problems that created a lot of marital problems and just challenges that was um, the fabric of my upbringing. And I'll never forget blaming the downfall of us financially and the, the challenges we had on that one key that wouldn't open the door. And so I made a commitment very early in life, even younger than 18, that I wasn't going to work for anybody. And and you know what? My mom and dad now are self-employed. My brother is self-employed and my sister. We're all self-employed. So I guess al- <laughs> along the way, we all decided to do that. So when you, ha- when you, you know, when you start out, I think with a with just a, that type of laser focus that you're going to be an entrepreneur, you're going to be a business owner, and um, and you just don't deviate from it. I, I think that's important. I think you have to really, I think we have to stop giving ourselves options and exit ramps and just stay real mm-hmm. focused. I was I was uh, talking with a guy who runs a tomato plant and very successful, seven thousand employees, and he said he'd rather fail at this than do anything else. And so he's focused, it's just despite the weather, despite the the uh, currency wars that he faces with uh, um, with uh, plants in Mexico and plants in the U.S. He said very clearly, "I'm going to fail doing this." He didn't say, "You know what? I'm going to do. I'm going to give it my best shot, and if not, I can be a consultant." Or, "Hey, I'm, I'm going to give it my best shot, and if not, I'll get a I'll get a job in an executive position over at Lowe's or something." Yeah. No, he said, "I'm going to fail at this." He he didn't say, "I'm going to fail at this." He said. I'm going to do whatever I can to make it successful, but if I fail at this, I'd rather fail at this than succeed at anything else. And that was my attitude as well, as I was going to, I didn't care, I was going to fail as an entrepreneur, and uh, that I would rather do that than work as uh, as a bank teller or even a an executive or management position at a bank. I, that just wasn't attractive to me. Hey, well, I, I think at this point, I think for all of us, we reached that point of no return, the Rubicon typically known as psychologically unemployable. Uh, and it's, yeah. it's just like, why, why on earth would I do that? I, you know, um, I, I'd rather struggle to make payroll <laughs> all day long than to even contemplate the thought process of, of, of working for, I see, I can't even say the words. <laughs> it just doesn't even come out of my mouth. It's like, what do you mean work for someone else? It, it just, it, it seems so against the grain now. Now, you've mentioned a number of different things, some habits, if, if I, I would even dare to say, because uh, you're living well within the means and, and not exceeding, not even increasing uh, your, your standard of living when the opportunities have been there. And many of us have heard of books like this, you know, Seven Habits of Highly Successful People, etc. And 
I'm just going to take a stab and say that you've got some habits that are, are daily that you do or frequent that you do uh, that have helped you to be the, the man that you are today. So uh, get, share with us some of those, uh, if you will, secret ingredients <laughs> that we can put in our own crock pot uh, to be able to go out there and, and, and replicate some of the things that you've been able to do. Yeah, so uh, there's there's a lot of habits that have been developed. I do sleep well. I will tell you that's been important. I read a book called Power Sleep, and that changed the way huh. I was thinking about it. Okay. Um, so I do sleep eight hours. It's important to me. And if I don't, then I have a sleep deficit that needs to be made up on the weekend or another time. Uh, I do work out regularly, and my workouts vary. I, it depends on my body. But uh, I've done everything from um, marathons to uh, long cycling rides to right now it's Krav Maga, which is Israeli martial arts. And I, so those are habits that haven't changed for years. I read one book a month. I read a, a book on a president um, pretty much every other month. That's slowed down just a little bit on leadership. Before I leave the office every day, I do the six most important things that I need to accomplish the next day. Um, And I pray daily. I have quiet time with God in the morning before I start my day. And that's anywhere from 10 minutes to an hour. And I drink lots of water, and I limit my caffeine intake. Those are all habits. That's probably enough there, right? Well, I'm... I'm if we I I almost wish you and I were in the same room right now because I'm 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 experiencing a whole bunch of goosebumps because <laughs> we have a lot of the same I'm just like okay I, we have a lot of the exact same habits from the water to the sleep and and to 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 the praying it's just like okay hold on wait a minute <laughs> well what's what? cool is that you know even your story jay you know my wife had a miscarriage that was a critical um uh, change in my life and so i really align with a lot what what you said so we're just brothers from another mother i guess i clearly clearly but did okay so does your wife use the crock pot i'm sorry i'm just stuck <laughs> i am really stuck on this crock pot thing because you, you you said texas and crock pot and i just started thinking about food so here's how crock pots will work so we're coming into the fall and so we have to you know we don't have to go to church we go to church on sunday so we're going to do crock pots uh before church so we can come back and watch football and there's food ready to go and everyone can yeah. enjoy the game yeah well your texas football is like mandatory right if it's part of this you know city citizenship in that state yes our gdp <laughs> just shuts down yeah, during football season that's right if you cannot be a texan resident you can't be a texan or a resident of texas if you do not like football and crockpots got it. that's exactly right <laughs> <laughs> we've got it connected together okay so um what would you say then because uh, there's and i think that for those that are listening and have been listening to the series you, you're hearing some of the same habits come up and what i want to point out specifically is how few of them had very little to do with things like, you know, I, I make 50 calls a day and I do this and, I, you know, business-related stuff. A lot of it had to do with either spiritual or health-related things. So I, I'm curious, um, what benefits do you find from keeping, you know, those, especially those health and spiritual-related habits, and how do they help you be effective? I'm sure you've heard it said before at least once that if you sow a thought, you reap a feeling. If you sow that feeling, you end up reaping a behavior. You sow enough behaviors, they form a habit. That habit then makes your character. That character then begins to influence and determine your destiny. The whole point is, as you are being introduced to individuals who are out there, can we say killing it? Listen to how they think their emotions, their habits, and we're definitely going to want to pick some of those up and add them to your repertoire. Because at the end of the day, if you can do some of these basic things, you do have a shot at numbers like you've heard thus far. Anyway, here's a good habit, in my opinion, is to pick up a book and read it. So you can go over to cashflowdiary.com forward slash free book. Again, that's cashflowdiary.com forward slash free book or send a text message to book or sorry, to 72,72000. The keyword is book. Text book to 72000 and that will get you a copy of Cashflow Diary, 10 Steps to Creating Wealth in Any Economy emailed to you 
immediately. Now, as you listen to the rest of this particular episode, think about some of the thoughts and feelings and habits that you hear and ask yourself, which am I willing to at least try and take on and see what the results might be? Yeah, well, I, you know, I can contrast it when I wasn't as, I guess, balanced. Um, and I just found that I just wasn't as sharp. Uh, I would get frustrated really easy. I would get anxiety because, you know, I wasn't sleeping or I didn't have perspective, you know, because of my, my relationship with God was different than it is today. So I, I would put too much pressure on myself. So, you know, when you have a lot of pressure and anxiety and fear, um, people sense that and the clients and the customers sense that, you know, you're anxious to get a sale and, and you don't have that patience. And so I think when we change our lifestyle and on our approach to life, uh, we tend to, we tend to be a little bit easier to work with and easier pe- people to do business with. And so, yes, I've had those habits of business that were, in fact, I used to tell myself three a day, used to, Three day keeps the creditors away. That means I made three calls. <laughs> oh my God! You yeah. did not just say that. Yeah. Uh, okay. Let me. Let me. Okay. Okay. You are killing me right now. <laughs> I. I tell everybody that I, instead of I said five yeses a day keeps poverty away. I am <laughs> not kidding. Those that are, those that are in our membership, those that have been listening for a long time, they're probably freaking out. Like, okay, Jay's talking to himself right now. <laughs> so this is this is awesome. This yeah, you're awesome. just ambitious. So yeah, five. I had three, right? Right, right, right. I <laughs> hey, I was just trying to eat. That was my goal. I was just trying to eat. This is crazy. I just how many things are coming up here. Okay, so let, let's let's talk about. <laughs> let's see if you. Let's see if we match here too. Uh, let's let's talk about the the money, the aspect. I mean, you're 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 in the business of money. So are we to a different degree. Uh, but we have to have a certain mindset about it, having it, not having it, uh, what we believe we can achieve financially. I mean, to some degree, comes a lot from the upbringing, where we've been, what we've been through. So, what are your feelings about the the word money? And, and did you have any challenges uh, with thoughts about money, positive or negative, having it, enjoying it, etc.? What essentially, what does money mean to you? Such a good question and, and, and a really an hour worth of conversation, but I'll make a few key points that I think will, will resonate with, with your audience. Uh, first of all, I've been with and without. I'd rather be with and without. I think it's easy to say. I, I didn't like not having money, and I like having the ability to buy things now, which is nice. I always told myself I wanted to at least afford school supplies for my kids. That was kind of my goal in life. <laughs> right. And so it's nice. School's coming around the corner, and I'm not worried about that, thank God. Uh, but I've been to the pawn shop before, and that's no fun. I pawned some yep. things that I shouldn't have pawned. And, I, man, you, I get them back, but, uh, boy, that's just a humbling experience and an expensive one for that matter. Uh, and then uh, today, I still want to make sure that I uh, pay people a fair wage. So I, I have um, guidelines on my compensation so the people that are serving me and the community, they're paid fairly. I don't want to I, – I, I had – in fact, I just had l- this last week – one of my clients who owns a company, um, one of her employees quit. And I, I knew that was going to happen because she did not uh, make a commitment to pay him uh, what he's worth. And so sure enough, he left. And so uh, sh- she decided to take more compensation and not pay him more. Well, that's, that's not something I'm willing to do. But I, but I think the most important thing that I want to mention is it was about um, eight years ago when I was completely broke. I went to the uh, I was in the financial services industry, still am, of course. And it's very difficult to be broke when you're in the financial services industry. Imagine giving people advice when you're broke. Right, right. It's not not easy. But uh, I, at the time, because we could only afford one car, my wife took used to pick me up and drop me off, and, and we did that for about a year. But I went to the office, and I was going to hustle my way out of our financial mess. And it was at four o'clock in the morning, but my key to the door didn't work. And so I'm having flashbacks oh, of no. my father. And, and what had happened was, is I left the key at the house cause they were on separate key rings. But, but I remember getting in the, in the, in the, in the car and rather than going back and getting it, I was just going to wait for somebody to open the building. But I sat there and I had a, a conversation with God and I know not everyone will understand this, but, but for me, it wasn't like an audible thing with a guy in the sky or anything like that. But, but in that commitment, I, I made in that dialogue, I made a commitment 
to uh, give the first fruits of everything I made. And I didn't, I didn't like say, hey, God, I'm going to give you money. And if you do, you were going to make me successful. It wasn't an agreement. It was just, I trust you in this moment. And, and despite the circumstances, I'm just going to prove that I trust you. And so I made a commitment when I was broke to give, and I've made that commitment ever since. And, and so what I've also identified is that because I'm very active in the way, in the way I give and, and, and I'm systematic about it, even when cash flows are up and down, I've also talked with a lot of people that do give and, and give their first fruits, not the leftovers, but as, an, as a testament of, of I tr- uh, trust – it, 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 it creates an, a, a different attitude with money. Uh, and so I've noticed, I've noticed working with thousands of families uh, on their finances, I've noticed that people who have that commitment to give tend to be happier with their money. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. Brother from another mother again. I mean, but one of the things that I think was interesting is the, um, the the decision to and I call it putting myself on financial restriction. Uh, so I limit the amount of money I receive uh, as well, and I have a very very relatively, in my opinion, small amount that I can spend my own way, and the rest just goes where where it needs to go, and it goes back into the company in various different forms to to help it grow and continue to provide quality service, etc. Uh, and some of these things are. I guess they're just universal. They're just what's required because it's one thing to, and I've, I've told people this, and I'd love to hear your thoughts. I, I think it's one thing to say, yeah, I'm financially disciplined when you've got no money. It's another uh, to say that you are when you actually have the options and choice of what to do with your time and or money. It is. In fact, what I've had to do today because um, I, 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 you know, I enjoy giving. Uh, I, I actually put a, uh, a ministry committee uh, in my office to put constraints on my giving from a business perspective um, because any charity golf tournament that helps kids that are hurting or hungry, I would do it to the degree that we'd go broke. So um, I, I still have to put constraints on my professional uh, finances. I do work on a strict budget. And then personal, we do we still do Dave Ramsey envelopes, so even today. And so, yeah, I think there's still a degree of you know that emotional money thing I have to be careful about that. My my wife, on the other hand, though, my wife will tell me sometimes you need to buy new shoes. You know, you've got holes in your shoes, Daryl. You can afford new shoes. You need to buy new shoes. And so uh, I do have suits I still wear that are 11 or 12 years old. Um, so there's still some challenges I have with money in terms of not only spending too much in certain areas, uh, but also spending too little in others. Um. I'm just going to say that I'm wearing a T-shirt I got for free, and I got a pair of new shoes last week, finally. <laughs> that's, all, that's, that's all I'm going to say right now. And I'll let you draw your the rest of your conclusions <laughs> yeah, from, from that it. point. From that point. So um, through this process, um, getting to you know any sort of revenue or any sort of income that, that's substantial requires, uh, I think, to some degree, Casting that vision, putting it out there. So I'm, I'm going to just assume that you you set goals and you work towards them in some way, shape, or form. Have you reached all the goals that you, you you've been after so far? Yeah, I got to say yes, uh, and, and that's it's all, it's a little humbling because um, it, I don't know how and 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 I know it's God, but you know that's prosperity theology, meaning that I'm going to say I'm going to put down a goal, and God's going to help me get to that goal because it's important to me. It's important to God, and that that's, life just doesn't work that way. But for me, I've set down goals, and and I've hit them. I, I never forget. You know, my first goal was uh, to make sixty thousand dollars, and I made that. You know, pretty much right out of college. And then my next goal was to make a hundred thousand. I made that pretty quickly. And then the next goal was to have a payroll. Believe it or not, payroll of a hundred thousand dollars a year. Nice. And and that and I hit that. And then you know I'm gonna make a million. And then hit that. And then you know it just keeps it keeps happening. And and so what I but here's here's my attitude towards it. Um, I keep hitting these goals, and I feel. And I'm and I'm constantly in prayer because I don't want to be out. And I and I this is not to be a sermon. This is just who I am. But um, I, I feel like if if I'm growing personally and professionally, that God must want to use me in some way. So I want to really honor Him if I'm if I'm on that path. 
And so I, I want to make the most of the resources he's given me. So I continue to set challenging goals because I believe God is a Texan and he thinks big. And so, <laughs> so I do continue to set big goals and, and we'll just see what happens. But they keep, continue to happen and, and I'm very grateful for that. He, he, I'm willing to bet he's got a really large crock pot too. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, uh, and what's interesting is uh, I'm curious to know, did it, did these goals happen faster or did it take longer than you thought it would? Uh, you know, I think some of them, ha- most of them happened faster than I thought, honestly. Uh, but I think the, there was a lot of pain to get there. That, that was probably the one thing I didn't, uh, didn't expect even if like I was hitting a um some I was in between a couple pretty good goals there was things that I just didn't anticipate happening I remember in 2011 we were we decided to start a hedge fund and, and a lot of times when I when I when I have the pain it's usually a direct result of some selfish ambition but I decided to start kind of a hedge fund which is at the time, there was a 10-year period where the, the stock market was just flat, and I was frustrated, and I wanted to make money for my clients. And I was really, in my mind, I wanted to do good things for them. And so I decided to start a hedge fund, and I hired a guy, and, and I invested a lot of money in it. And we lost so much money, not for just us, but for clients, and it was just a debacle. And that I would have never thought. In fact, my, my business partner at the time, he uh, – he got so sick with anxiety that his colitis flared up and he was hospitalized for six months. Oh, wow. And, and we dealt with so much in that one year. And I would have never anticipated that we had to go through that experience to be where we're at today. And so I think what I understand is that the time is less of an issue. It's just the, 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 the storms that occur in between. And, and those things I just don't quite anticipate. But what's really important for me now is to know that those storms come. I get that. It's how I respond to it that really matters. Um, and so uh, I think today I'm proud that that uh, it may be maturity, but I think it's a lot to do with my faith is my response to the storms are a lot better than they used to be. Well, you bring up a, a very, very important point. And, and I often let people know it's not that I don't feel fear. It's not that people who are successful don't feel fear, or don't get afraid. It's we we have the same stimulus come at us. We choose to respond differently, and learning how to respond differently is part and parcel of how you're you're going to make it through. We're not exempt from problems. <laughs> at least I'm not, and and if you are, I would be very very upset. By the way, uh, so what do you think is like if 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 someone is listening? And they're investing a significant amount of time trying to reverse engineer and understand uh, every possible conceivable scenario that happens before they take action. Uh, is that time well spent? <laughs> I, you know, um, I think it's good. You know, I, I, um, I th- who first builds a house without counting its cost, right? So. I think it's very wise. I mean, I'm a certified financial planner to sit down and and recognize um, what what the costs are, what the risks are. You know, the SWOT analysis, the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Uh, what those look like. I think that's there's a lot of wisdom in that. I don't think that uh, letting that paralyze you from taking the next step and saying, you know, those threats. Are, are too big for me to move forward. I think you just say those, that's just the, that's just what it is. It's a part of the game and I'm going to deal with it. But, but to, to recognize that you have to have a certain runway of, of finances of cash to be able to, to navigate and pay the bills. I think all those things are important. So I do obviously believe in good planning, but I do not want that to paralyze you or anybody for that matter to, to, to get this information and just pause or get fearful or analysis paralysis. I think you just take it and just know that that's, that's what it looks like and then go. <laughs> Agreed. And so when is enough information enough? How does one know to go? Yeah. So in my opinion, there's wisdom in the council of advisors. So I typically spend time um, talking with other people. I set up a, an advisory council um, for our company a while back. And there are about six business people that I respect that have the same value system that I do, but have uh, been uh, been down the road a little bit longer and have run businesses. And I usually take these uh, next steps uh, to them and let them wrestle with it and look at it from a different angle. So it is so critical that we take it to other people. Of course, the spouse is first and foremost. I, I 
Uh, you've got to get the spouse on board. Of the, otherwise, it's, it's dead in its track. I mean, my spouse has saved me. My wife, her name's Caress. By the way, who has a wife named Caress? Isn't that cool? It sounds like a soap almost. <laughs> yeah, it's like a soap, <laughs> but with an E. Yeah. So, but I would have failed had I not had her commitment. So the spouse, you get the spouse's commitment, 100% all in. And then, and then you get around other uh, uh, successful people, even if it's only one or two steps ahead, get their feedback, and then, and then you move. Well, so your spouse has a unique name. My wife's name is Poppy, which is not exactly normal. Uh, so you've got soap, I've got a flower. This is <laughs> awesome. And we both have people we go to for advice. And what I find interesting is that you said business people. So it wasn't necessarily mom and dad or someone who has never had any experience in, in business that you're you're asking. Because sometimes I, I see people, you know, hey, I, I talked to my friends and this is what they said, but you know what? They've never wrote an offer, never did a deal. They don't have customers and you're listening to them. Yeah, you know, and I get that a lot because I give people advice on their investments and their uncle, you know, told them to do something. And I had one the other day that said, you know, uh, Daryl, my investments aren't growing as well as my friends. He made $60,000 last year on his investments. I said, well, how much does he have? I don't know. He made 60 grand. I mean, we're not even, he could have $2 million and that's a 3% rate of return. I have no idea. And so we don't really have a context. And so uh, I get so many people who have opinions and you know their opinion is could be as good as the Chinese food they had for lunch. If it was good Chinese food, their opinion is good. If it was bad, it was bad. And so, absolutely not. I am not interested in in, in haphazard opinions. I want people who've been there and also who have wisdom. That you know, if they're going to give me marital advice, I want them to have a solid marriage. You know, if they want to give me dieting advice, then I, I want I want to know that they're in the game too. If they're giving me business advice, so I'm going after people who have a track record of not being perfect. I'm not asking for that but just a track record in that space well we all know there's only one person who's ever made it perfectly uh and he's written a really good book that has lots of direction in it uh to help us figure those things out however speaking of imperfections i'm going to assume that you haven't always batted a thousand i'm assuming there's at least one decision you're like oh my god and you've been gifted what we often call significant opportunities for deep learning and introspection also typically known as a mistake so my question to you is would you say that that's a necessary part of a journey can they be avoided you know what does one do when they realize one of these failure events yeah, so the failure events are necessary, and um, I, you know, obviously John Maxwell wrote the book "Failing Forward," and and that's such a good book that just the title alone, you don't even have to. I mean, the book's good, but just memorize the title, and it's <laughs> and everyone repeats that "Failing Forward, Failing Forward." But yeah, it's kind of a part of it, and I tell my kids, they, I have four kids, and and if I told them life happens to you, it's and I and I stop, and they'll they'll all respond, it's. It, it's it's how you respond that matters. That's that they know that that's that's a truth. Mm-hmm. So we we know life is going to happen, and and it's really how we respond that matters. And so who is, um, you know, who, who is? I, I don't want to get in preaching, but but for me, who is the resource that I'm going to go to? And of course, it's God in the in that circumstance. And then how I treat other people in that environment. For example, if I have a vendor that messes up and it has a material impact on my business. I'm going to shoot him straight and tell him he messed up, um, but I'm also not going to attack him like negative generalizations and 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 attack him as a person. So I really think that we, you know, we know that happens that those mistakes happen, but we have to take a preemptive strike on those things, and 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 measure so- ourselves up as a person and say we know those things are going to happen, and rather than being in the heat of the battle, I need principles and resources that I use when those things happen. And so we're kind of always in training, preparing for those failure events. And so when we get around people, you know, we're the average of the five people that we spend the most time with. When we read books, when we're rested, we're kind of setting ourselves as, up as a preemptive strike for that chaos that's just right around the corner. Uh, we're, we're, we've got it coming around the corner. It's going to come. It's how we respond that really matters. Agreed. 
100%. I mean, the opportunities can be won or lost, and even new opportunities can be created from some of those events that you might not have considered before. But hey, Daryl, I just want you to take a guess at how many kids I have too. You have four kids. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> yes. Love it. Uh, yeah, yeah. This is this is getting pretty weird. But that's all right. That's all right. That so pretty soon people are gonna think that I'm just going to be exactly like Daryl and Jay, because clearly that's what it's going to take. Well, I guess there's some truth to that, and four kids part of it. I don't know. Uh, you're not you're not six foot one eighty five good looking guy, are you? Uh, six four. Uh, <laughs> and, and so and and one ninety five to two hundred, depending two hundred and two, depending on the day. But depending on the crock pot, right? And, uh, right, right, exactly. If you if if caress made something great, then maybe I'm a little bit heavier. Who knows? Uh, so uh, yeah, it this is this is really interesting. Now I will tell you that my wife was an excellent, excellent all state volleyball player. <laughs> no, I'm not joking. Okay. I'm My telling. wife is in the Hall of Fame for volleyball and track at her college. <clears throat> uh, uh, I, am, nice. <laughs> I am not kidding. <laughs> this is crazy. <laughs> uh, all right. So who knew? So see, now they really know the inside of what it's going to take. You need a spouse that plays volleyball. You got to have four kids. <laughs> um, I mean, hey, if we're, we're, we're breaking down, if you want to get to that 100K in 30 days, <laughs> This is what it's going to take, obviously. <laughs> Who knew? Who knew? That's great. That I, I think it's, well, it's just pretty interesting. The, just the number of things that are the same. So with, with all of these things that have happened and, and transpired for yourself and your business, I, I mean, I know I, I love creating jobs. I love the, the idea uh, when you, you know, increasing payroll and et cetera. And I, I can remember when, I started paying people more than I used to make in the corporate world. And I was like, when did that happen? When did I become that guy? What have been some of the mindset shifts, the the challenges, the things that you didn't, you were just like, why? Like, do you ever step back and just go, wow, this is like my life? Yeah, all the time. I Yesterday, no, day before yesterday. So yesterday, I went to Schlitterbahn with my kids and spent all day. So in the middle of the week, we went to Schlitterbahn, biggest water park in the world, right up the road from San Antonio. And I took my kids there, and I just blew out Wednesday and, and just I, we opened the park at 10 and closed it at 8. I mean, I'm exhausted today. <laughs> uh, but the day before that, I was in one of those pinch me kind of things. I, I I was asked to be a keynote speaker at a luncheon, 150 business people. Uh, I did the presentation. Uh, apparently, I did great because when I'm done, I, I have books. My book, Small Business, Big Pressure, and 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 so I'm sitting there with a stack of books, and the lines out the door. I couldn't get to everyone. I'm signing autographs, you know, doing that author thing, and and I'm done. I'm like, holy cow, did that just happen? And so that was absolutely crazy. I told my wife, I go, what is, this is just nuts. I mean, do they know who I am? I mean, I'm just, right. you know, I'm just a normal guy like anybody else, but certainly have a passion to, to helping others through business. And, and I think they saw that when I was on stage. These moments happen all the time. And, and the reason I think it's important for me in particular to say, man, this is just amazing is because I think in the essence of that appreciation of of those crazy things that you would never think would happen. I think there's humility in that. I think when I get to the point saying, yeah, this is me, this is I deserve this and kind of walk with a limp a little bit. Mm. I, I think in that in that moment, I think I'm done. I think I'm toast. I think that's yeah. the point where pride takes over. And that's that's in my experience been one of the falls of any great men. And so I really appreciate that I appreciate those moments. And when I don't appreciate those moments, I need to be concerned. Indeed. I, I get you 100%. And I'm sure at this point, um, there's a few more people who might actually want a copy of that book or track you down in some way, shape, or form. So for those that are listening, uh, tell us how we can find out more about you, what you're doing, maybe even pick up a copy of the book. 
Yeah, so uh, what's the good news and bad news is my book launched and it had a successful self-publishing launch that it actually stopped distribution, <laughs> uh, got picked up by a New York publisher. It'll be relaunched in January 2016. But in the meantime, if somebody wants um, an ebook that I did, which is really good through a lot of research, it's 30 Small Business Startup Mistakes. They can get it on my website and that's uh, smallbusinessbigpressure.com um, and they put in slash mistakes. The ebook costs money, but if they put in a code for your audience, it's cash flow. They'll uh, they'll get it for free. I like that code. That's for sure. <laughs> so that's perfect. That's perfect. I think uh, there's going to be a, a number of individuals who are interested in understanding more of the systems and and the things that it's going to take to be successful. So as we wind down here, let me ask you this. If someone w- was coming to you and thinking to themselves that, you know, I want to get in business, I think, you know, but the idea of getting to, you know, that level of revenue, I, I don't know what it's going to take and-, and what I'm going to do. What would you just say to them in general? What would you encourage them to do to be able to figure out if they've got what it takes? I, I don't know if this is the answer that your audience is going to want, but it's really putting uh, two things, putting one uh, one foot in front of the other every day. So just it's just slow and, and methodical and not expecting it overnight is the attitude of choice. But also an attitude of solving people's products. I mean, uh, solving people's problems, not selling products. Right. So I, I think if you go in with an attitude that you have a really altruistic heart, um, I, I'd call it ideal, ideal pragmatism, where you are really want to solve people's problems, but you want you need to make a profit, which is really what business is: is solving people's problems, but with a profit. If you really have that attitude, then I think the money comes. And I know that sounds odd, but I, I believe that to be true. And you have to make good business decisions along the way, unless you're in the ministry or nonprofit. But if you're in the for-profit, you put together a good business model and you execute with excellence, but just really have that attitude of solving people's problems. I I think you win. Agreed. 100%. 100%. And I, I hope for, for those of you listening that you're getting something out of listening to these higher performers, high achievers, high, big thinkers, and uh, in this case, people who use a crock pot very well. <laughs> <laughs> Daryl, I, I just want to say thank you, uh, for, honestly, for just taking the time uh, to be able to invest you know, your information, your knowledge, and your understanding here with us at the Cashflow Diary. Oh, my pleasure. I had fun. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you know what time it is. It's time for you to move at the speed of instruction. I can tell you something that I'm going to do. There's a book out there that he mentioned called Power Sleep. I know I've been tracking my sleep. It's something that I do. I like to make sure I get a number of good cycles in, et cetera, every night. And and I've got this neat little alarm clock that wakes me up at the perfect time in my sleep cycle, which works very, very well. So I'm kind of interested to find out more. Uh, I know that that's something I'm going to do. And I'm sure you heard something in general as well that you can do. Well, when should you do it? The answer is now a clock. So go make it happen. It's been fun talking to you today. I look forward to talking to you soon. Until next time.